<laughs> Hi everyone, this is David Smith from No Kill Colorado. This is No Kill in Motion from the No Kill Movement. I'm here today with James Evan of CARE. Very excited to have this conversation. Um, CARE is, you know what, I'm gonna let James actually talk about it. James, give us an introduction to CARE. So first of all, thank you uh, for having us and, and thank you for the video you all made, I guess, back in July um, yeah, that sort of highlighted that. care. Uh, and I have to say, those are the kind of things um, that I think are so important, that that initiative to start talking about diversity and inclusion um, and making it important. I personally don't think a person of color needs to be the initiator of that conversation. So we, we were really impressed that you, you all took the time and the energy to have that conversation without us. I mean, I think that that is how we're going to move forward. So um, we really, we got a kick out of the video. You guys hit all the right spots. Um, and so we just we wanted to say thank you. I know. Um, you're welcome. It, it, it was, uh, we had a, a more than one conversation, but one on video <laughs> that you saw. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and the fact is, we absolutely love this organization. And we're so happy to have you on today. Oh, uh, well, thank you. Um, to, to answer your question, uh, we spent uh, years in the mass comms world. I started a firm in 1999 called Home Communication. Uh, right around 2008, we were hired by HSU US to do a, a large scale spay and neuter campaign in Louisiana and Mississippi. And at the time, those two states combined were responsible for some of the highest euthanasia rates in, in the country. And so we were brought in to um, create a communication plan to bring those spay neuter numbers up and those euthanasia numbers down. Um, the campaign went extremely well. At the end of the campaign, we still had a, a cache of, of money left, uh, thanks to Maddie. Um, and, I, and I mean that honestly, Maddie funded that campaign. And, um, after the campaign was over, we realized there were some caches of zip codes that weren't responding well to the campaign. And when we looked closely at it, we realized those zip codes were the most underserved or the underserved people in the Gulf. Um, and so the campaign was essentially low cost spay neuter, but even at $40, we realized there were some community members that, I mean, that's, that's a month of dinner at McDonald's, and so it, it, it's a lot of money. We do them here in, in Colorado. You know, we yeah. get down to, in rural areas down to ten, ten dollars if we can because it's really yes. yeah. Uh, but again, you know, uh, because we had that money left, we said, you know, what happens if we were to give away free spay neuter? And so that's what we did with that cash of money that was left at the end of the campaign. Incredible successful we went into communities where it was you know somewhere around 80 percent not spayed and neutered and that free spay neuter turned that into um 80 percent who were signing up for spay neuter and we quickly uh sort of designed a program that's now called pets for life that gives away free spay neuter and other um, pet support um we were we were you know, primary architects of that program at Alum, myself included, I think I wrote probably 70% of the Petrolife toolkit. And so that, that was a labor of love. It was incredible. Um, at the time, Petrolife had an enormous amount of people of color working for the organization, not so much um, today, unfortunately. Um, nevertheless, um, I think it was the impetus of having this conversation where we were bringing people of color to the floor um, for one of the, for, for the first time in animal welfare. But it seemed to me and my colleagues that animal welfare is always sort of highlighting people of color in one particular way. And that is, you know, here is a free collar, here is free spay neuter. Um, and so it's almost a, this is what we are doing for people of color not here are the geniuses and the creative people and the architects of programs um, that are helping animal welfare. 
And so that was always in the back of my mind, but weeks, weeks before, maybe three or four weeks before George Floyd was killed, Spring Point Life O'Reilly called uh, me and said, you know, we've looked at your, pro your, your portfolio, Pets for Life, Adopters Welcome, and you seem to be the only organization as a loom um, who is sort of pushing the envelope on diversity and inclusion in the animal welfare space. And they made us an offer to start an organization that they would fund, uh, be the principal funders for, that was solely focused on diversity and inclusion. And so, um, as I said earlier, we, we see them not only as our primary fiscal donor, but they were also a moral donor, I think, to animal welfare. Uh, out of all of the organizations that fund uh, Life O'Reilly, Spring Point, you know, took that initiative to say, this is important. We need to bring diversity to the animal welfare space. And that's how CARE was born. Shortly after we started the organization, George Floyd was killed. And so to think here we were four weeks prior, um, taking a focused effort on starting an organization that would help animal welfare become diverse. And then George Floyd's uh, video goes viral and everything exploded for us. And I think for the, for the first time, there's a large group of animal welfare organizations that sort of realize um, sort of how vulnerable we all are as a nation when it comes to the lack of awareness uh, on diversity and, and inclusion and, and social justice. So that's how CARE was born. Well, I, yeah, that's a great story. I realized it and it was, it, it was shortly after that. Um, there's something that you may be aware of, the 21 day um, racial equity challenge, which I actually took. It's online. Uh, it's a lot of stories, a lot of um, podcasts. Yeah. And I was listening, and um, it was actually a very old essay that I looked at, which was talking about how someone was listing their privileges that they didn't know about. And yeah. I took that list and I moved it into my animal welfare work. Yeah. And I realized, uh, you know, and they came up with free right away. Um, I can walk into a place and adopt, um, you know, I can uh, more easily. Right. Nobody suspects me of everything. And, and the key one was I can walk into anywhere and I can volunteer without any questions. And it's crazy that that is something I never noticed before. When I noticed it, I, I couldn't believe I never noticed it before until I was challenged with actually thinking about it. And I thought, yeah. That's insane. And, and then I, you know, I see actually in animal welfare, I've been in animal welfare for over a decade, um, that there's just, there, there is very little representation on the participant side uh, at the leadership level. Um, and, and frankly, I was blind to it. So um, yeah. it, it just amazed me. What do you, what do you say to people, um, well, people like me, you know, how, how do you bring them to the next step to be more aware of what's right in front of them? Yeah, I, I thankfully, and I appreciate that question. I think it's really important. It, it strikes at the heart of what, what non-minorities have to deal with is number one, put your guilt aside. That's, I think that's number one, right? The, the house we all live in is, and this nation is not a house that any of us built. It's just the house that we're now responsible for, right? So it's really important to step away from this concept of, am I the blame? You don't have to be the blame to be the fixer, right? If I see trash on the sidewalk, I can pick that trash up without analyzing whether or not I'm responsible for that trash. Ultimately, I don't want to live in a community that's filled with garbage. So pick it up and, and move on. Um, I had some really unique experience. I, I actually started out in this world uh, in my adult life or childhood anyway, being an artist, a fine artist. And I, I used to teach, um, maybe five years ago, I, I used to teach young people um, drawing skills. And it was amazing to me, Al almost always, I would have a classroom full of kids and I have a, a really, really short kid standing here and a really tall kid here drawing the same perspective. 
drawing, you know, just some cubes on a table. Right. And the tall kid would say, look at the shorter kid's drawing and say, that doesn't look right. And I would say, get on your knees and bring yourself at, to that person's level and now look at the still life. Wow. All of a sudden, all, and, and this is, I mean, it's an amazing thing that happens, right? All of a sudden, the tall kid is now looking at the squares and the cube on the table three feet lower than where the child was before. And all of a sudden, um, that, that tall kid that was essentially saying this kid's drawing is a lie is now at that kid's level and saying, oh, now I see the truth as that person's perspective. And so when you are, when you are not in someone else's world, I think you have to really be patient about um, what that other person is confessing to feeling or seeing. And if you can move from where you are, go to where that person is, um, there are lots of different Americas out there. And so um, I think to really be an American, to really be a patriot, we have to learn to sort of think about what, what that America looks like for other people. Um, and that includes animal welfare. Um, but the, what I do love about animal welfare is that it's predicated on being humane. So, you know, having this diversity and inclusion conversation within animal welfare, I think is causing more people to think m more than they would in normal industries because the industry itself is, is designed to be humane and more thoughtful. So I, I, I think where there is a problem in the field, yes, but I think the solution is so, sort of the bedrock of the industry, which is to be um, more humane, to to not kill, um, to not hurt um, animals. And, and I think more people are thinking about how, how can I apply that to that neighbor that's standing you know, next to me. That's a fantastic perspective analogy, actually, um, uh, about the, the, the kids drawing. I absolutely love that. And I have to agree with you. I have higher expectations of people in animal welfare to understand this. It's, we're built on a foundation of compassion. Um, yeah. And I have to admit, when I have a hard time getting someone there, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm shocked, uh, you know, coming from my perspective now, when I don't see someone like, I think it should click right away. And I think it does for most people, because I think we do have the right, we have the right foundation in animal welfare for that understanding of uh, racial and social equity. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to switch a little bit here on you because yeah. I'm also a, uh, I'm, 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 I'm a data geek. Um, and I absolutely love something on the site that says a 3% adoption in a 3% uh, uh, increase in adoption of people of color results in 2 million pets being yes. adopted. That is a remarkable number. Can you tell me more about how you guys came to that number and what you have seen out, out in, the, in, in the adoption world? Yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it is amazing. Um, underserved people adopt at a 3% rate, 20% uh, lower than what middle-class white Americans adopt at. Uh, many of those underserved communities are uh, getting their pets from neighbors and friends, and they confess to this readily. Um, and then obviously there's more to the world than just underserved people of color, but there are other people of color um, that we have learn anecdotally that often come in to volunteer or often come in to adopt. And for some reason, they are not adopted to. Um, and so we've decided to do a research um, program, uh, research project, I'm sorry, on exactly that with the University of Tennessee um, to find out how many people of color are actually being um, rejected from and welfare organizations. And so anecdotally, we have all of these stories, and I mean some incredible, incredibly bad stories, but we know that the data shows us looking at um, the household number of pets in different uh, ethnic communities, uh, Latino Americans are, are right under white Americans, African Americans are the next lower percentage, and then Asian Americans are the next lowest percentage. So uh, 
using that that data, and it's on the website, we supply it to layer the, the link. If we increase that number of people of color, all people of color, um, including people that identify as, as mixed race, um, <laughs> three to five percent is not a lot, right? But it because there are so many people of color, and we could if we could tweak that adoption rate up just a little bit. Um, you're talking two million animals that could go into happy homes. And so in order to do that, I think one, we need to think about more open adoption policies in general. Um, and we also need to think about other marginalized groups like senior citizens that who also often get rejected, uh, people without homes who also typically get rejected, people without homes and people that are home insecure meaning they might be renters, um, you know, we have, a, I think, a long way to go, but just with people of color alone, two, three to five percent, we would be in the two millions. And so we have heard anecdotal stories of, of, of people going in to uh, get adopted, uh, to do adoption, and being asked, a uh, single woman that just reached out to us, that she was asked, um, where her baby's father was and whether or not he visits the home regularly. Um, and I, I just, it just astounds me the things that we're asking people. So on, on one hand, we're saying to the world, don't shop, adopt. And we say that broadly, we say it proudly as we should. They listen to exactly what we're, ask, we're asking and they come to us and we say, um, no, not you. I, I meant that message for someone else. Um, if your last name is Rodriguez or Martinez, it's very likely that you're not gonna be responded to in the same way as if your last name was Smith. And so, you know, these are, these are mostly anecdotal stories in terms of the cause for that lower number of adoptions. Mm -hmm. um, and we are doing research to find out if, if that's actually true, um, that essentially is the field so biased that it acts against itself when it comes to um, uh, adopting people of color. Hey. And so on one hand, we want to incentivize people of color to press the system, to actually don't shop, adopt, come in and, and adopt, attempt to adopt an animal. And on the other side, we're saying to animal welfare, if we open up the world um, to our cause, expect the whole world to come to our door. If we ask the whole world for a donation, we're not asking people to only donate if uh, they have a fence or only donate if they're under 75. We're asking everyone to donate. So everyone should be welcome when they come into a shelter or rescue. No, and that, that, that's, that's fantastic. Something in No Kill that we've been talking about forever is that there are more, we know there are more available adopters then there yes. are animals that are being killed in the shelter. And yes. this, this was fascinating for me to say, because it's something I didn't know until I went to your site, that, that I, like, they're right there. Like, they're right there. You can actually see who, who it is. It's like they're not adopting as much as everyone else. Yeah. What are we doing wrong? And if we don't look at it from an animal welfare uh, standpoint of, what, where do we change to yeah, actually there are, get those adopters? Yeah, there are 100 and roughly 120 million people that live without pets. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, if, if we were selling a widget and our audience was 120 million people and we had 8 million widgets to sell, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's an enormously big audience. I mean, the, the, the people that, that think like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or whomever, I mean, that's, a, that's an enormous market, right? We should be able to clear the shelters over and over and over again. Um, and there, there to me is no reason if, if we have at least 10 million people that are looking, actively looking for pets and our primary competitor um, is saying to them, everyone's welcome. All you have to do is, is pay online or uh, come to this roadside um, place where I'm selling pets or come into my pet store. Those are the, comp that's the competition. Right. Regardless of whether or not that store owner um, appreciates someone coming in with a hijab, 
doesn't matter. That person is still going to leave with a pet if they have the right amount of money. Yes, they are. And we have to have the same mentality if we really want to stop euthanizing healthy animals. And if we really want to clear the shelters, we have to say everyone is welcome. Anyone that we believe um, might, we might have questions about, it, it's, about a, it, it's about a conversation. Are you a senior? Are you 75? Do you have a plan? If um, you die, do you have someone that will take care of the animal? And if you don't, we suggest that you find someone. Right, right. let, let it help you with the plan. If you exactly. don't have to, we let will us help, help you. We will help you with the plan. I mean, it, it, it really is about moving that animal into a home where it's going to be loved. And if it's only going to be loved in the case of a senior for a short period of time, does that senior have a plan um, for that animal to go somewhere else? And I, I think most seniors, if they weren't thinking about it before, we introduced the plan, they would include it in their will in conversation with their loved ones. And so right now in underserved communities, pets are passed around all the time. Pets, people are adopting at the same rate, meaning it, they're taking strays in or they, they're, they're taking in neighbor's pets or they're purchasing animals um, from backyard breeders. And so it's obvious that we all want companion animals in our lives. So we, to me, we have to find a way to reduce those barriers that we're putting up um, so that we can really clear the shelters. Um, so that's, that's our hope and dream. Really. Well, I, yeah, and I'm, I'm gonna stop you there because that was the perfect ending to what, what we're talking about. I have one more thing that I do wanna ask you though. Um, and that is, so how do I, you know, how do you encourage or how do local organizations reach out to CARE and actually adopt um, some of the programs and services that you're trying to get them to implement? So that's a great question. So we have three, we have three divisions. Our, our one division is research and development. We have another division that is narrative focused. So we're producing narratives. I think one you highlighted on the last video. Um, it's been since 1977, since the last time of uh, African American family was featured um, as, as a bonded family with a pet. And that was Sounder. And those people were sharecroppers. So we really need to work on the narrative so that when a person of color that looks like me walks into a shelter or rescue, the first thing that pops into you, so that the first thing that does not pop into your head is, oh, that guy looks like Michael Vick to me, right? We have to change the narrative. And the second, the third wing is training and we're also doing consulting. So if you really want to aggressively, I think, attack a, a plan for your community, um, we're available for um, consulting. But ultimately, I think people need to do exactly what you all did is start having conversations about the data, about one's own perspective. It is obvious if all you have to do is look around animal welfare, some of the biggest organizations out there and their website, their Facebook pages are devoid of people of color. And you, I think we have to ask ourselves, why is that? Where, where are the 44 million people that live with pets, that people of color, um, why don't we see them? Why don't we highlight them? Uh, where is it? Where is it in leadership? Are you are you in an organization where you've never met someone that is in an executive role that is a person of color? And why is that in a in a country that is full of opportunity um, to bring in leaderships of color? So um, I think those are first. I think it starts with questions and conversations. And if you need help beyond that, we're, we're certainly happy to consult. Well, James, um, I could spend the rest of the day having this conversation okay. with you, um, but our time is running out, so I'm going to have to end here. I want to thank you so much for coming. This is James Evans from CARE. I'm David Smith from No Kill Colorado. This has been No Kill in Motion. We'll see you all next week. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, James. Have a good Sunday.